Stand with me, will you, for the reading of God's word from the 15th chapter of Luke. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 rich, righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so. I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Father, we thank you for this insight into your character, into your life. Uh, we acknowledge the, that you are absolutely other than us. Father, you're transcendent above your creation without question. We could never begin to absorb one fraction of who you are, and yet you give us these insights that are enough for us, and they draw us to you. Will you please do that today by the power of your Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. While we enter... Uh, wonderful chapter here in Luke 15. I wish we could do Luke 16 first and then come back to Luke 15. Luke 16 is tough, as you'll see when we get there. But, uh, you know, I hope one of the things you could do is be reading ahead each week uh, before we come to church to kind of figure out, okay, what is this passage all about? What is he going to say about that? And uh, if you get any good insights, send them to me. I'll be happy to use them. But uh, be thinking about what is it that we're studying? What is the Lord teaching us here? It's a good it's a good exercise, a good thing to do. But the 15th of Luke, one of the most wonderful chapters in the whole Bible. It, uh, it, it gives us amazing insight into the heart of God. I think the theme, of the, the theme of the chapter can be illustrated in this little story. President Thomas Jefferson was riding with some friends one day and they came to have been raiding a lot. They came to a river that was flowing overflowing, it had washed the bridge out. And there was a man standing there contemplating how he was going to get across. Well, Jefferson's companions took their horses into the water and managed to get to the other side. And then as they were watching, the man came up to Jefferson and asked him if he would help. And Jefferson said sure and got him on his horse and with not an easy time, they managed to get across the stream. When they got to the other side, one of the friends of Jefferson said to this man as he got off the horse, he said, do you, do you know who you asked for help? Do you realize that was President Jefferson? He said, well, I, I, didn't, I confess I didn't know who it was, but I know when I looked into your eyes, I saw no, and when I looked into his face, I saw yes. That's what this chapter is all about. It's about seeing yes in the eyes of a loving Heavenly Father. And it's a good thing to see yes in the eyes of God. You know, the Pharisees, when you looked at their faces, you would have seen nothing but no. But in the face of God, we see yes. This account opens with the tax collectors and sinners crowding around Jesus. These are the outcasts of society. And so Luke has set the stage by showing us who is there listening to him. And then we get this wonderful phrase in verse 2. It says, this man receives sinners and eats with them. You know, we, we should be saying, well, of course he did. This is why he came, to seek and to save those who are lost, right? According to 
Mark 10, 45, he came not to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So this is why he came. But the scribes and Pharisees were absolutely indignant that he would surround himself with this kind of rabble from their perspective. They would not have touched these people with a 10-foot pole. They believed that their lives would be, would be polluted by any contact with these that they considered sinners. But not God. Not God. Look at verse 10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. When God finds a repentant sinner, beloved, his great heart is overjoyed. Jesus knew that these Pharisees would never feel that way. But, but those who share the heart of God share that feeling. They long for others to come to faith in Christ. And they share with God in rejoicing when others come to him. Now, in the first two parables that we read that we'll cover this morning, we will see kind of the movement as God works in somebody's heart. How do, they, how do they come to this point of repentance? How do they come to this point of faith in Christ? And I want us to see this because it's so dramatically illustrated here. You know, the behind the scenes, no one comes to Christ unless, unless God is calling and and pulling them toward him. The, the, the divine work of salvation is clear. When Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 that, it is not, that it, even our faith is a gift of God, it's, it's not by works that we could ever do. And yet from the human perspective, here are the things that need to happen for us to come to faith in Christ. And they're all they're all wonderful if we will realize them and apply them. So what's the first thing? Number one, we need to realize we are incurably lost without Christ. We are incurably lost without Christ. Both parables make this point. The woman loses a coin. Maybe it was part of her dowry. We're not told, but it was a, something that was precious to her. And so she's desperate to find it. The shepherd loses a sheep. It may have been his. It may have been that he was shepherding someone else's sheep, which made it even more important that he had lost a sheep. And so he is desperate to find it. Now, I think Jesus uses sheep in this case for a very specific reason. He uses them not because they're warm and fuzzy, but because they're dumb and stupid. <laughs> That's why he uses sheep. And he uses them to represent us. So you understand now it's not because we're warm and fuzzy. It's because we're irretrievably spiritually stupid. That's why he uses them. You know, if a dog gets lost, he might find his way home, right? We've all seen the Lassie movie, I'm sure. Does amazing things, find his way home. Sheep would never do that. Sheep cannot find their way anywhere. That's why they are always in need of rescue. Sheep are driven by their desire for food. A lot of us could probably say that, but it certainly is true for sheep. They'll go for grass anywhere. I mean, they're just looking for the green, right, wherever it is. And if they see it up high, they'll go, they'll go try and get it up there and then find out later they can't get down. Or if they see it down below, they'll go try and get it there and then they can't get back up. They will follow each other into absolute oblivion. Have any ever seen a movie? I tried to find the name of this and I couldn't remember it, but some movie we saw one time where a bunch of sheep just followed each other right over a cliff. It happened in real life, 2005. There were 1,500 sheep in Turkey. One of them went over a cliff. All 1,500 followed. That is a sheep. And that's what God is saying, you're like. And that's what I'm like. He's saying we're driven by food. We're oblivious to danger. And we are following others to spiritual destruction. Remember, Jesus uses physical truths to teach, physical realities to teach spiritual truths. And that's exactly what he's doing here. He's saying now just as sheep are driven for food, so every person alive, every person alive, including everyone who is seated here this morning, 
feeds on something. That means that there is something in your life and in mine that drives us. There is something that is more important to us than anything else. There's something that we look to as that thing which gives us meaning and which gives us value. It's our soul food. It may change from time to time as we move from place to place, but we all are seeking soul food constantly. It may be ambition. And I think that I will really find my true worth when I get to the top of the ladder. And so I'm climbing those rungs on the ladder to get to the top. And I'm, and I'm feeling that I will only be of value. I will only really express my true self when I get there. Anything wrong with wanting to excel at a career? No. But if that's number one, if that's your soul food, and it becomes destructive. Perhaps it's a relationship. You know, if that guy or that gal will just marry me, then my, my life will have meaning. I will find my true self if I can have this relationship. Anything wrong with wanting a relationship? Anything wrong with dating? Of course not. But if that relationship, see, becomes more important than anything else, and my security is tied up in that, even as married couples, we can do this. That relationship is so important to me that it's the most important thing in life. Then it can become the soul food that takes us down. Perhaps it's money. You know, money for me perhaps has become a means, become an end instead of a means. And you know, my thought process is kind of like, you know, when I, when I finally get that $500,000 or that million dollars in a bank, then I'll be secure. Then I'll be bulletproof. And so money has become our soul food. Jesus is saying, if you're finding your soul food anywhere other than in me, you're in the wrong place. You're finding it in the wrong place. He told the crowd in John 6, 35, I, am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Do you see what he's saying? He wants to occupy. He needs to occupy. He must occupy first place in her life. He's saying, you've got to believe in me. I must be your soul food. All those other things will eventually let you down. They will all disappear one day. Anything else will soon be over with. So ambition cannot save you. Money cannot save you. Relationships cannot save you. The respect of people cannot save you. Pleasure cannot save you. All of those will be gone in the blink of an eye one day. But I, Jesus, will never disappoint. I will never be gone, you, but you are lost without me, hopelessly lost without me, and you don't even know it. And our problem is we, 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 won't even, we won't even recognize that we're lost. We will not acknowledge that we are lost. We, we won't believe it when the Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all gone astray, but we see that in that next patch of grass, not as straying. We see it as the thing that's going to save us. It's the thing that's going to make my life worthwhile. It's the thing that's going to make me important. It's the thing that's going to give me prestige. It's going to the thing that's going to fulfill me. That's how we see it. Jesus is saying, no, it's, this, it's the next sucker food is what it is. It's leading you astray and you're going astray willingly. The enemy convinces us that that's where we will find worth. And ironically, what Jesus is saying, listen, there's no hope until you realize that you're hopeless. You're like a sheep. You're lost. February 6th, 1995. So was that 21 years ago? A Detroit bus driver, a guy who drove one of these municipal buses downtown, was due, his shift was over and he was due back to bring his bus back to the place where they kept them. And he didn't show up. 
didn't show up at the terminal. So they started checking around. They called his wife and she said, uh, no, I haven't seen him. She said, he has been on some medication that I suppose could have caused him to be a little disoriented, but, uh, but I, I don't know where he is. Six hours later, some patrolman 200 miles northwest of Detroit pulled this guy over, driving slowly down a rural lane. He pulled him over. He said, sir, where are you going? He says, I'm headed for the terminal. Hopelessly lost. And that's what the Lord is picturing for us here is our condition without Christ. Hopelessly lost. It doesn't matter how confident you are. It doesn't matter how much you believe in this other thing. To the extent that you're saying, this is the thing that gives my life meaning, to the extent that you're going your way as opposed to his way, to that extent you are lost. That's the blindness of people outside of Christ, oblivious, like the Pharisees to the lost condition that, 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 that they existed in. Look at verse two. The, the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. They grumbled at seeing, why did they even care who was around Jesus? But they grumbled because, because he claimed to be a rabbi like they did and they didn't want to be associated with that even through osmosis. And they said, this man, they grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. I mean, think about it. Did they even have a clue what they're saying? They're announcing the best news that's ever been given. This man eats with sinners, receives them. That's good news. But you see, that's good news that the Pharisees were never going to experience. Why? Because they would not acknowledge themselves as sinners. Until you know you're lost, you can't be saved. Until you know that you are a sinner, you can't find a savior. Until you acknowledge that you're going your own way as opposed to his. You can't really have Jesus. You can think you do. Pharisees thought they did. Blinded, lost, hopelessly. I see a 53, 6. All, all we like sheep have gone astray. Every one to his own way. Chasing what looks good to us that's taking us down the road condemnation. Remember how that verse finishes, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But until we come to the place of recognizing that it's our sin, until we own our sin, until we see that that's the sin that was laid on him, until we see that it was our sin, that it was our selfishness, that it was our going astray, that the Lord took on himself on the cross, until we see that, acknowledge that we are lost, hopelessly lost. Well, what does it say secondly? We need to realize that we are intently looked for by Christ. We are intently looked for by Christ. Suppose you're kind of exploring around in a boggy area one day. You're walking around and in the process, all of a sudden you notice you're beginning to sink and you turn to go the other way, but it's too late. You've stepped into quicksand, and the more you struggle, the deeper you go. And pretty soon you're up to your neck, and you remember seeing something on TV holds your arms out, and it'll keep you from sinking not quite as fast as you might otherwise, and you start hollering for help. But the more you try, the deeper you go. The more you holler, the more no one comes. What do you need? You need a Savior, right? Right? You need a savior. You're not going to make it on your own. You need a savior. But what if no one comes? Then you are hopelessly without help. And that's what Jesus is saying. That's who you are outside of Christ. That's why the next part of Jesus' parable is so wonderful. The coin is lost, but the woman in verse 8 is going to light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. The sheep is lost, but the shepherd in verse 4 is going to leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. I mean, that is glorious news. 
It's illustrating what? It's illustrating that as we, even as we are sinking in the quicksand of death and sin that we were born into, there's help coming. There is a Savior. Due to the great heart of God, there is someone who is coming to the rescue. His holiness, yes, it's true, condemns us. But his love, beloved, provides a Savior to rescue us. You can't, you know, the problem with, with trying to define God is that we, that, we, that we get one part that we really like and we latch onto that as though that's all of him. And in our day and time, of course, the part is love. God is love. Yeah, well, he is love. But he's not just love. It's, it's kind of like the minute we think we have a whole handle on God, we, we're, we're probably further away than ever, but we for sure need to look at these two sides, God's holiness and God's love. They're two sides of the same person. And while his holiness condemns us, his love can save us, but we, we must respond. Savior is there. John tells us in John 1, 9 that Jesus is the light that lights every man who comes into the world. Jesus is shining light in every God-forsaken corner of our world, seeking for those who will repent and turn to him. That's why Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. The heart of God is reflected in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, where it says that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's his desire. That's why he came. First, First Timothy 1.15, Paul says this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. He got it. Beloved, here's the message from those passages. No one will ever be able to stand before God and say to God, nobody came. No one will ever be able to say that. God, because he loves sinners, has sent his son into the world to do exactly what those passages say. A savior has come. And let me tell you, that Savior, according to Revelation 3, verse 20, in his own words, is standing outside the heart door of anyone who has not repented and given their life to him. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come in. It's up with him. But you must open the door. The Savior has come. Your rescue from the sin that separates you from God is at the door. If you insist that you're really not in quicksand, you're that rare bird who is not a sinner, <laughs> that's a problem. Or if you insist that you can work your own way out, that you can climb up by your own bootstraps or climb out by your own methodology, that's a problem. But it need not be. There's a Savior. He's there. He's come. You'll never be able to say no one came. He did come and he has come. You know, I love the, look at verse five. So, such a clear illustration here of the grace and the love of God. Look what he does in verse five. It says, when the shepherd, when he's found that sheep, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. What is that all about? Well, let me tell you what that's about. That shows us that this rescue is absolutely thorough. It shows us that he does everything that is required to get this lost sheep home. You see, it's not enough to find a sheep. You find a sheep and say, follow me, good luck. Doesn't work. A dog, you find your dog who got lost, you say, Shep, come, and what happens? He follows you, right? But not a sheep. Shepherd knows he's just going to run around and get lost again, and so he picks him up, rejoicing that he's found him, and he takes him home. Beloved, it's a picture of the grace of God that picks us up, that takes us all the way home, doesn't ask anything of us except to repent our sin. No works allowed. Nothing else can we bring simply to thy cross I cling, the old songwriter said, right? Shepherd by grace picks us up and he takes us home. It's all by grace, it's the gift of God that can bring salvation into our life. 
you know, there's, there's, another, there's a great example of this in the, in the first chapters of the Bible, in, in Genesis chapter three. Remember how Adam and Eve had sinned. And look at this, Genesis three and, and verse eight. What did they do after they sinned? They, they rushed to the feet of God and begged forgiveness and say, oh Lord, we, we goofed up. We, we, we did what you told us not. Is that what they did? They did what every human being ever since has done. Regardless of how much we protest that we're seeking God, we're running as fast as we can away from him. That's what they did, verse eight. Chapter three of Genesis, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But, I forget who it is, Barnhouse, I think it was, but somebody says, is to thank God for the buts in the Bible. And it's true, they lead us to salvation almost every time. And here it is again, but... The Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Not because he needed information. Soliciting repentance. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. See, Adam and Eve ate at the wrong place. Ambition was the soul food that they took in thinking it would satisfy them, that it would take them to the next level. When they found out it wasn't true, they hid, and they would have never been saved, except God came for them. Just as God comes for every sinner who will ever repent. It's not because we're so smart. It's not because we're so good. It's not because we're so deserving. It's not because we're warm and fuzzy. It's because God comes and God has come in the person of Christ. And even in the case of Adam and Eve, you'll recall that God gave them an illustration of what salvation is all about when he killed the animals to cover them with skins to replace the leaves that they had tried to cover themselves with. Illustrating what? Illustrating that a sacrifice is gonna have to be made. If you're gonna be saved, it's gonna cost somebody somewhere. Now, the killing of those animals and the providing of those, of those skins to cover them did not save them, but it pointed forward to the one who would, who was whom? Jesus Christ. God has come. No one will ever be able to say, you never came. Because he did, and he does. Jesus has come to seek and to save those who are lost. Thirdly, we must realize that we are infinitely loved in Christ. Infinitely loved in Christ. Look at the shepherd who represents the father in verses six and seven. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who, we have to clarify this, righteous people who think they need no repentance. That's the point of what Jesus has to say. He's not suggesting that there are those who need no repentance. He's saying there are those who will not acknowledge that they need repentance, and so they will not come. Look at the woman representing the father in verse 9. When she has found the coin, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I lost. And then to make the point crystal clear, verse 10 again, just as I told you, there is joy before the angels of God over the sinner who repents. What a verse. I love that verse for a lot of reasons. I love it for one reason about, because it illustrates how naturally, do you notice how naturally Jesus describes what goes on in heaven? Just like, oh yeah, this is what goes on in heaven. How can he do that? Because he's been there. Because it's where he came from. That's why he knows the things that he knows. And so when he says the father rejoices over one sinner, he's seen that. He knows what that's like. He knows how much the father loves us. Imagine God the father loving you so much that he is rejoicing over every sinner that comes to repentance, just as he rejoiced over you if you've come to repentance. 
What a deal. I don't know whether he rings a bell and you know the sign goes up or what, but he's rejoicing. It's amazing. And notice, you know, I, I always grew up thinking it's the angels who are rejoicing, and actually I'm sure they do, but that's not what this verse says. It says there's rejoicing going on before the angels, in front of the angels. <laughs> who is that? It's God the Father. It's the Father. The Father is rejoicing over one of his lost sheep who has come to repentance. Aren't you glad God isn't a Pharisee? Wouldn't be much rejoicing if he were, would there? I'll tell you, here's the Pharisees would have written this passage. They would have said there is rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that God obliterates. That would be their opinion. No, there's rejoicing in heaven over every sinner who comes to repent. There's a great verse, Zephaniah 3.17. You can look this up and uh, put it in your devotions next week sometime. Zephaniah 3.17. God describes there his unbounded joy over those who will turn to him in repentance. It says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness now listen to this. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Can you even imagine God the Father singing over you? That's incredible. That's amazing statement that he makes there. He should give us goosebumps. Goosebumps. He says, he says, God will quiet you down. You get in the presence of God. He will quiet your heart. Whatever the fears, whatever the anxieties, whatever the loss, whatever the pain, he will quiet your heart. He will rejoice over you and he will exult over you with loud singing. How good is that? We need a lot more of this than we get, don't we? God the Father rejoices over us. It's an amazing thing, beloved, to be found by God in Christ. It's an amazing thing. Let me close with this illustration, a little longer than normal, but I think it's worth it. January 10th, 1948, a Hungarian refugee named Marcel Sternberger living in New York City. He got on the bus to go to work that day in the city, he lived on Long Island, 1948. For some reason, he decided to go see a friend, a Hungarian friend who he knew was ill. Hadn't planned on it, but as he's going, he thinks, I, I think I'll stop off and see my friend, and so he did. Stopped off to see his friend. The result was he didn't get to work that morning. It was, it, it was middle of the afternoon before he was finally on the, on the train again headed for work. So he had this unexpected delay. When he got on the second train to get to work now to go into New York City into his office, it was very crowded. And he looked around for a seat. He finally found one. And he sat down next to this young man who looked like he was probably in his late 30s. And he noticed as he sat down that the man was reading a Hungarian newspaper. So he thought, that's interesting. Now, you've all been to New York. You know that you don't talk to people in New York, right? But he looked at it, when he saw that paper and the guy was obviously Hungarian, he thought, I, 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 I should say something. So he asked, would you mind if I read your paper? He was interested. Of course, it came out, they're both Hungarian, so they start to share stories. And the other guy's name was Bella Paskin. Bella Paskin was a young man who had been living in Hungary when the war broke out in 1939. He was a law student. He was soon uh, basically drafted by the Nazis and sent off to the Ukraine as part of a labor group, labor battalion. But as the war progressed, of course, he was captured by the Russians and then he spent the rest of the war in a POW camp. That was where he'd been when the war was over. He spent several weeks kind of working his way back to his hometown of Drebchen in, in Eastern Hungary. Well, Drebchen was a, a city that Sternberger was well acquainted with. So that took them off on a talk about 
the city for a little while. And then Paskin got back to his story. <coughs> Sternberg asked him, what happened when you got home? He said, well, when I got to the apartment where, where, where my folks had lived, he said uh, there were people there that I had never met. And he said, the same was true upstairs where I lived with my wife. New people were there. I asked them, did they know anything about the people that used to live there? They didn't have a clue. So he said, as I was, as I was leaving the building, uh, I ran into a, a, a neighborhood boy who I recognized, and I said, do you know anything about my parents who used to live there? And the boy said, I don't, but maybe my parents do, and he took him home. The parents said, oh yes, your parents, we remember them well. They said they were, they were captured by the Nazis, they were taken off, and they, went, they were sent to Auschwitz. Your parents and your family are dead. Of course, he gave up hope when he heard that. With Hungary under Russian domination by that time, he knew he didn't want to stay there, but it took him two years to figure out a way to finally steal across the border one day and become an immigrant to the United States. He had been in the United States three months at the time he ran into Marcel. Well, as Paskin was telling the story, Marcel is thinking about a gathering that he's been to just a few weeks earlier, and he'd met a young woman there that he didn't know, but they got talking, and he found out she had been a resident of Hungary, that she had been sent to Auschwitz, that all of her family had been killed there, but she was young and she was healthy and she'd been sent to work in a munitions factory in Germany. She survived the war. When the Americans came and took over that part of Germany, she became part of a group that immigrated to the United States in 1946. Marcel was very moved by her story, took down her name and uh, phone number, thinking he would invite her the next time they got a group together of Hungarian friends. As he listened to Paskin talk, he couldn't imagine that there was really any connection, but he said to Paskin, he said, is, there, is your wife by any chance, is her name Maria? He said, Paskin's face just went white. And he said, yes, how did you know? And he said, I, I think we should get off the train here at the next stop. I need to make a phone call. So they exited the train. Sternberger dialed the number. He was about to hang up when somebody finally answered. The woman on the other end who didn't speak good English usually didn't answer the phone, but there was nobody else at home that day. She finally had answered. Sternberger talked to her for a while, explained who he was, and she remembered him. And then he said, can you give me a description of your husband? So she described him. And then he said, what was your address in Drebchen? She gave him an address. So Marcel turned around and he looked at Pasca Abela and he said, uh, he said, what was your address? Did you live on such and such a street? And Pasca says, yes, that's, that's, that's the street we live on. So Marcel said to him, he said, listen, he said, try to be calm. <laughs> Something miraculous is about to happen. He said, I'm going to give you this phone and you're going to be able to talk to your wife on the other end of the phone. And so he did and, and he, he listened for a moment as, or watched for a moment as Paskin took the phone and then suddenly he said, yes, I'm Bella, I'm Bella. <laughs> and then they talked for a little while later and, and, and then he got off the phone and Sternberger Said, let me, he said, I don't, I don't want to intrude on your reunion, but let me put you in a taxi and send you off to where you can see your wife. And so he did. So 10 years after they had last seen each other, this young man and his wife were reunited in New York City as a result of who knows what unbelievable circumstances the providence of God operating in their life. Someone asked the wife later, what she remembered. She said neither one of them remembered very much about that reunion, but she said this, I remember only that when I left the phone, I walked to the mirror like in a dream to see if maybe my hair had turned gray. The next thing I know, a taxi stops in front of the house and it is my husband who comes toward me. Details I cannot remember, only this I know, that I was happy for the first time in many years. Beloved, I tell you, it's a wonderful thing to be found. It's a wonderful thing to be found. We are born into a lost condition in this world, but there's a God 
There's a Savior who has come to seek and to save those who are lost. His eyes always say yes. The question is, what do our eyes say in response? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have not let us go astray without seeking us out. I, I can't imagine why you would why you would bother. I know that ultimately it's all about your glory and that in some way you will be glorified in what you have done. But oh Lord, to think that at such great cost you have come to seek and to save those sheep, us, who have gone astray. Those of us who have turned every one of us to our own way. We're falling following our own way to feed our souls on things that will not last instead of on the Savior who will last forever. Lord, I pray, I pray that for if there's anyone here today who has never, ever come to you in faith, never really put their faith and trust in you as Lord and Savior, never said yes, would you help them to do that now? Would you place in their heart, Lord, the faith to believe in you, the desire to want to, and the faith to do so? For the many, I trust, who are here today who have been found, Lord, help us to have a new appreciation for what you have done for us, to seek us out and to find us. But Lord, please drive home to our hearts the fact that we have friends and loved ones who have not yet been found. And the way they get found is through the message of your word. That's what you say. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Help us to, Lord, we want to live it in front of them and then share it. How can we hold back on news like this? What kind of a man would Marcel have been if he didn't even tell Pascal, I think I know your wife? What kind of people are we? If we will not at least people, let people know, I know your Savior you will come to him. Thank you, Father, for the grace that comes only from you. Bless us as we sing this song in closing, I come to the cross. Lord, help us to be there again right now. Those of us for the first time accepting you as Savior, I pray that you will put that in the hearts of anyone who has not trusted you. Those of us who know you, we come again to renew, Father, the faith in you that we say we have. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen.